Who doesn't like a little havoc with their Halloween? I know I do, but now for all the truly terrifying entrance music that has terrorized pro wrestling through the years, there have also been a candy bucket full of songs that have famously failed at frightening fans. So in tribute to these timid tunes, I'm creeping it real because my name is Kevin Callis, this is Wrestling Behind the Themes, and here's a list of the 10 not-so-scary entrance themes that went thud in the night. When big bad teams like the Legion of Doom and Demolition roamed the earth, not only did they paint their faces to freak out the masses, they worked super stiff and were able to strike fear into their opponents with ease. Fast forward a few decades to when the Ascension rose from the ranks of the NXT Tag Team Division after pummeling the competition there for over two years. However, once Connor and Victor made it to the main WWE roster, they unfortunately got put in their place, and buried quite quickly. With their not-so-scary entrance theme called Rebellion, the Ascension boldly claimed that they were born and bred to rip and shred, but the only ripping and shredding going on was with their contracts being terminated. The Black Scorpion is a Wrestle Crap Hall of Fame gimmick where an unknown mystic claiming to be from the man called Sting's past would taunt the Stinger from the spooky shadows. Speaking in a voice distorted just enough to keep fans guessing his true identity, while good old JR spits some boo sheets about Scorpy possibly being the ultimate warrior, Sting, remember California, 1986. Uh. Turns out WCW couldn't sign Warrior and they really had no clue who to put under the mask, so the angle essentially became a cluster of a parts unknown party. WCW Booker and Emmy Award winning voice of the Black Scorpion, Ole Anderson knew only one thing could save this storyline, and no it wasn't a freaking spaceship or this not so scary Turner Music Production theme song, but rather the Nature Boy Ric Flair and his big old bird beak as the big reveal. Woo! For several years in the mid-1990s, WCW's most evil force was the demonic faction known as the Dungeon of Doom. Led by the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, and his kayfabe father, the Wizard, their monstrous cast of bizarre baddies included former heavyweight champions like the Giant and Big Van Vader, but also included a motley crew of not-so-scary superstars like the Shark, the Zodiac, and of course, a mummy named after a snow monster who turned into a ninja, aka the the Yeti, with wacky vignette after wacky vignette inexplicably dominating WCW programming, things went from bad to worse. As soon as the group made their way to the ring, to the strains of this laughing stock of an entrance theme song. I know it seems like I'm basically kicking WCW in the nards here, but they deserve it, especially after putting on one of the most infamously awful pay-per-views in wrestling history. Halloween Havoc was an annual PPV, but the 1991 iteration of this pape was truly terrifying for a number of reasons, mainly the opening Chamber of Horrors match where the winning team would be declared only after a member of the opposing team had been electrocuted, or murdered however you prefer to say it. Now figuring they should double down on the spear of the season after frying Abdullah the Butcher in an electric chair, the next contest featured the random coupling of Big Josh and the rap master Pia News squashing a tag team called The Creatures, who just happened to be jobbers Johnny Rich and Jumping Joey Mags. Now this not-so-scary xylophone heavy entrance theme, while not long for The Creatures, did get a decent run later in the decade thanks to Mexican luchador Psychosis.
Widely considered one of the most unorthodox competitors in WWE history, the half-man, half-beast Mantar approached the ring wearing a ridiculous life-sized stuffed bullhead as his not-so-scary entrance theme song snorted from the arena speakers. All right, hold on here. I just got to stop here for a second. Can you imagine having to travel with that thing and lug it around through airports and such? Anywho, now after removing the cringe carcass costume from his dome, Mantar was revealed to be nothing more than a bearded doughy man who barely had any animalistic characteristics at all. But in my humble opinion, the real shame in all of this is the missed opportunity of a classic mid-card feud between Manny and El Matador Tito Santana. I mean, forget about the Hollywood backlot brawl between Roddy Piper and Goldust, and imagine if you will, a Mexican bullfight fight death match at WrestleMania. It took several years for Glenn Jacobs to strike it rich as the big red machine Kane because he first had to endure a string of bad gimmicks like being the Christmas creature, the fake Diesel, and of course, as Jerry Lawler's personal dentist, Isaac Yankum DDS. This cheese came from the mind of Vince McMahon who for some reason thought that the best person to help Lawler in his feud against Bret Hart was the King's evil Ivory Carpenter. Now the DDS was no D. MD and his not so scary theme song with its soothing waiting room music combined with the unnerving sound of dental saws and drills made for one of the most ear splitting entrances ever. It's extremely difficult to try and listen to this track without wincing at its over-the-top attempts at being scary, because it ain't. I mean, this theme would perfectly fit Little Miss Bliss if she were featured in a Halloween parade at her favorite place, Disney World, but instead, The Evil Is Mine is excruciating nonsense from the apparent POV of Alexa's alter ego. However, while Alexa's playground was poorly received, Bliss could be heard laughing maniacally all the way to the bank because her descent into a darker, infantilized version of herself translated into big money and no whammies after reports that Bliss and her creepy doll Lily sold more merch than any other WWE star not named Stone Cold Steve Austin or John Cena. In the spring of 1989, the human wrecking machine Zeus entered the WWE to confront Hulk Hogan and to declare himself to be the true star of the epic blockbuster film No Holds Barred. Really blurring the lines between fact and fiction here. Now, most somewhat intelligent people understand that in movies, there are actors playing characters. So why did this movie character come to life and start stalking the Hulkster in arenas across North America? Things that make you go, hmm. However, you couldn't knock Zeus and his freaking massive shoulder pads the frick out. Because although he may have been a brutal bulldozer of a heel, the 6 foot 5, 300 pound monster had a not so scary, serious slap into bass man entrance theme song. Originally thought to be the second coming of Andre the Giant, the eight-foot-tall Jorge Gonzalez proved to be far from the eighth wonder of the world. Wrestling for WCW as El Gigante in the early 1990s, the enormous Argentinian soon arrived in the WWE as Giant Gonzalez and immediately targeted the legendary Undertaker during that year's Royal Rumble match. But it wasn't the former draftee of the NBA's Atlanta Hawks Assault of the Dead Man that fans remembered. Instead, it was his odd outfit. Looking like a rejected character from Harry and the Hendersons, for some strange reason, the Fed thought that putting an eight-foot man in a furry bodysuit with airbrushed muscles would get over. Turns out that Gonzalez wasn't the slightest bit scary, and his boring and monotonous entrance theme was also a giant misstep.
I've heard it said that the Ascension were essentially a poor man's version of the powers of pain, and I have to agree with that statement. But when the Warlord and the Barbarian were first put together in Jim Crockett promotions, they were two up-and-coming, imposing brutes that really looked like they could square up and defeat the Road Warriors. Unfortunately, that result never happened, though, because apparently the P.O.P. were afraid of heights and refused to wrestle the Warriors in any of their scheduled scaffold matches. So they took their talents to the Fed, but instead of being world wrestling wrecking balls, they struggled in the competitive tag team division that was only made worse by this perky babyface entrance theme music that not so scarily screamed 80s butt reverb rock. 